In the world of language, there are few people as experienced or as respected as Patsy Lightbound distinguished professor emeritus at Concordia University in Canada. She has been working in the field of language learning and language teaching for more than 40 years as an editor, a writer, a researcher, a consultant, and she literally wrote the book on how languages are learned. In this interview, we talk about language learning, language acquisition, language teaching, and what life has taught her about the way that education works. This is an edited version of our interview. If you would like to listen to the full version, then you will find a link down in the description box, where you will also find a link to her website. I hope you enjoy it. Dr. Patsy Lightbound, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today. I look forward to it. <laughs> for people who don't know you and your work, could you just uh, talk a little bit about who you are and what you do? Like you, I grew up in a place, a different part of the world. I grew up in North Carolina in the U.S. in a place where at the time um, English was the only language I heard, although there are some people who uh, make jokes about the quality of English in the southern U.S. I, I don't join in those jokes because now that I have linguistic sophistication, I understand that there are many different ways of using and speaking English. Um, but I never heard other languages until I got to um, high school. And when I was 16, I had a French teacher who was a, the wife of a military man who had been stationed in the town near where my rural North Carolina high school was. And, and when I started learning French, I just thought, wow, this is, this is a whole new way of seeing the world. And it didn't hurt that this teacher was dynamic and beautiful and exotic in my mind. Um, and so I got really excited about languages and in a way that changed everything in my life. And I, I, I often, I mean, it, it, it literally changed everything in my life in the sense that I pursued French French became my college major. French became my area of study. It took me to Europe, where I met my husband. It took me to Africa in the Peace Corps. It, it, I, was, I taught French for a while um, after I finished my graduate studies, or began graduate studies, and I went back and furthered my graduate studies. And that's when I discovered language acquisition as another area of focus. And when I was in, at Columbia University, sort of not sure whether I wanted to continue the kind of teaching that I had been taught to do and that I had that had been used on me, which was at the time mostly audiolingual drill pattern practice. Um, and then I uh, took a course in uh, child development. And the one of the first lectures we had in that course was on child language. And I said, bingo, no wonder we're so unsuccessful in the classroom. We got it all wrong. We're not focusing on meaning. We're focusing on bits of language uh, that are sort of disconnected, and we need to focus on getting people to say what they mean and and understand what what other people are saying. So meaning meaning and form connection right there uh, changed the direction of my research. And I went to Quebec, to Montreal specifically, with the plan of gathering research data on early childhood bilingualism, but discovered that my students, uh, because I also started a job uh, at Concordia University in Montreal, I realized that my students were not so interested in early childhood bilingualism, except in a personal way. Professionally, they wanted to know about what happens in classroom language learning, because that's what they were preparing for. And so my focus in research turned to the classroom. And uh, I spent a lot of years looking at English as a second language in Quebec, but also began to look more at, uh, I looked also at French as a second language, uh, French English bilingual programs, eventually dual language programs in the US and in uh, other parts of the world. So classroom second language learning and classroom bilingualism have been the focus of my research for, all, for 40 years or so or more. Yes, and, and I think you're probably most well known 
uh, among teachers and, and maybe even students for your book that you wrote with uh, Nina Spada called um, How Languages Are Learned, which is now in its fourth edition. Um, and it was, but it was first published in 1993. Um, yes. So it's, I think that the, the book has seen a lot of changes in, in, in what we know about how languages are acquired. And, and I wanted to just sort of follow the, loosely follow the structure of the book with, with a couple of questions. So could, I, I wanted to talk about the individual first, the student. And because I think maybe it's something that is not so well considered in the classroom is the kind of student as an individual. Um, so, so what, what do we know about individual variation in language learning ability? Well, what we know and what we believe are not necessarily the same. Um, we don't know nearly as much as we need to know, I should say. Um, I can remember when I first was teaching um, uh, pre-service teachers and I would start uh, by asking them, what do you think is the, the biggest impediment to success in classroom foreign language teaching? What do you think, why do you think students don't succeed in the classroom? And can you, can you guess what the teachers always said? Um, <laughs> because they don't listen to me. <laughs> they always started with, exactly, they'd say motivation. They don't care. They don't want to learn. They're not bothered. And, and I would always respond to that, it, it, and that was in the context of Quebec. You know, the biggest impediment is the amount of time they have to give to the language, because language learning takes an enormous amount of time, and, and people should never underestimate the importance of time in language learning. It, it, it astonishes me still that you will see advertising for even these wonderful high-tech gadgets and tools that are wonderful in themselves, but to imply that you can learn a language um, in three months or three weeks or whatever they say um, is just is, is so misleading and so counterproductive. Language learning is a lifetime project. And even in our native languages, we keep learning, we keep learning. And for a second language speaker to be made to feel uh, incompetent or inadequate because of not having mastered the language. You know, the, the famous, I took French for six years and I still can't order breakfast. Well, you didn't take French for six years. You took French for three hours a week, uh, several months of the year for over drip, 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 drip over the time. So time is a huge thing. And, and I, so yes, the individual in the classroom is, um, comes, to the, comes to the experience with a lot of different expectations and a lot of different abilities. I, I do believe there are differences in our, um, I'll call it natural language learning ability. People, some people are more talented than others. I don't think it makes sense to argue against that. Um, but it is not the case that people fail because of their individual differences so much as because of, the, uh, of our failure to give them the time and the opportunities they need and, the, and, and to enhance that motivation that they may or may not lack when they come to us um, as, they, as they take all those years to uh, actually learn the language. So, so what, what about the kind of the, the, the equilibrium between uh, the quantity of time and the kind of quality of time? Like surely 10 hours of really bad teaching is the equivalent of 30 minutes of great teaching. Is there a kind of... Well, I like that equivalence. It sounds quite mathematical and <laughs> precise. Um, uh, to be sure, um, you, as I say, people say I took French for six years. Um, they didn't really take French for six years. And, and to say that they had studied French, I, I mean, the classroom, what I always say is the classroom is where you start learning. Um, and, and in the classroom, what we, what we really want to do is give people confidence that they can learn. We want to give people tools and, and strategies that they can use when they encounter the language outside the classroom. And we want them to feel motivated and capable of 
encountering and using the language outside the classroom because otherwise they're never going to learn because the, the classroom just can never be enough unless that's what you decide to devote your whole life to. And even, even when we look at things like immersion courses, um, immersion is kind of a, it's not quite the right word, is it? it it's the word we use, but it's it, true immersion is rare and it, it, it pretty much requires picking up and moving to a new location. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, there's so many things that you've sort of uh, talked about that I'd like to go a little bit deeper. And, and I think one of them is, is getting back a little bit to, to what you said about unrealistic expectations. And, and I'm kind of wondering because, you know, a majority of, of students who are learning a language right now in the world who are learning English, you know, they'll, they'll be in some sort of state or private education in a classroom with a teacher and and probably as well they have a course book um, and then uh, when they've finished the course book they'll have some sort of exam you know on on the content of the course book and I'm wondering given all everything you know about you know language acquisition how, how do you feel about the kind of standard classroom learning experience well I, I guess I have to go back to the to the thing that I said before <clears throat> about what the purpose of the classroom is. Because really, when you think of it, what you've just described, the purpose of the classroom there is to prepare students for an exam. That's really the purpose. And some students in that environment will acquire enough skill and knowledge and enough confidence to expand beyond the classroom and continue to learn through um, electronic interactions, through reading, through personal um, engagement with people who speak the language. Um, but the, the, your, your description of the textbook followed by the exam um, it's true that that's what the experience is of many, probably most students in the world who study a foreign language. Um, but it can only be successful if it if it motivates and prepares students to keep learning beyond that textbook and that exam. Um, I remember one of the exciting moments in my language learning um, when I was back in that 16 year old stage where I had been studying uh, French in classroom and I, and I really liked it. I'm one of those people that Steve Krashen jokes about. I mean, I love grammar. I just think it's, I just love it. I, I diagrammed sentences on my grandfather's knee, literally. Um, so I love grammar. So I had fun doing that in the classroom. That was exciting to me. But then I discovered a book in the, in my grandparents' attic. It was called A Simplified French Reader. And it was a book of stories, most of which I already knew because a lot of them were fairy tales and such um, cultural, um, uh, cultural icons. So I already knew the story, but then when I picked it up, I could read it because it was simplified French but I, I felt like such a genius because I could now go beyond the sentences that I had learned in the class and I could get something meaningful out of a French text. So that was one of those big steps that took me, I mean, I didn't know anything in those days, of course, about extent, extended reading or, or reading, comp reading as the source of vocabulary development or any of those things that I came to know uh, as a, as a teacher and researcher, but I do know that I was really excited when I discovered that I had enough knowledge to get more, that I could, I could take what I had learned in the classroom and use it to, to find more language and more content. And that was really exciting. So I think the, the, the textbook and the exam are only as good as as they are only good insofar as they prepare students to go beyond the textbook and the exam. It's funny because the way that you talk about the classroom almost almost removes 
all of the technical stuff from from the equation like the things that, that you you talk about that are important in the classroom are almost all kind of psychology really it's about like motivating the students and you know preparing them to use and and that's probably not how most language teachers view their role they feel that their role is you know filling the students with all of the technical stuff right that's a really interesting comment i i, I appreciate that let me think about that for a moment. Yes, I think I think that's a reflection. I think that's partly also a reflection of the way I learn. And I have I've actually been discussing this with people lately in a different totally different context that I'll maybe explain to you later, but I, I describe my own learning as as um it's sort of non-sequential. I don't think of myself as a person who learns this. I think what I've been trying to do is I've been working with um, a group of people who have no background in cognitive psychology or, or even what you would typically call educational psychology. These are uh, young teachers in Guinea, in West Africa, who are working in classrooms where their students, and these are their young students, their children in primary and pre-primary classes, and the, the history of teaching in these Francophone countries is the, the history of the French colonial system, which is all about sequence and practice and memorization and exams. And I keep trying to break out of that pattern um, by saying, you know, you don't have, you don't, you must never assume that because you taught that last week, now they know that, so you teach them something else this week, and you just add it on. And all of these years, I've, I've talked a lot about, you know, language learning is not cumulative, it's integrative, you don't learn one thing, and then another, and then another, and just make it all a big, long line of linear learning. Um, but uh, I've, I've seen it more and more in this context, where I'm trying to tell teachers, you know, don't worry if they haven't mastered that this week. You can teach it again in a couple of weeks. Meanwhile, teach something else that will get them excited and that builds on that, but doesn't depend on it in a, in a literal point by point way. Um, learning is cyclical. You just have to keep coming back to the same thing. You never learn something once and one, it's not, what do they call it? One and done. Never. Everything, everything that you learned today is changed by what you learn tomorrow. So it's, you got to keep coming back, keep coming back round and round picking up the same things and then understanding them in a different way. You understand and you've personally seen, you know, classrooms that where the teachers maybe have very little training and they may have very few or even no resources. And, you know, there, there seems to be this, again, there's another kind of conflict in the field. It's like um, you either have uh, course books and you have materials or, or you don't. And, there are, you know, for example, I know that you've talked about content-based learning and there's other things like task-based learning and then there's Scott Thornbury's Dogme and a lot of them are about kind of eliminating resources. Um, and, and I'm wondering how you feel about, you know, do you feel that there's a big necessity to have a lot of resources in the classroom to actually be successful at learning a language? That's a, a, a great Great big question, a good great big question. <clears throat> um, the the work that I'm doing now with um, teachers in in Guinea in West Africa is with teachers who are teaching very young children, children in preschool and primary, and so for them, the 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 resource that they are accustomed to, first place, they're not accustomed to having any instruction for children in the, at the preschool age. And this is a, a big change in their understanding of what education is. Um, what they're accustomed to is children sitting in rows, usually lots of children in lots of rows, uh, in front of a teacher who stands at the blackboard and writes sentences that they all say in chorus. I mean, the only resource, the only physical resource in the classroom is indeed the blackboard. Um, and there are no manipulatives. These are children who are, are supposed to be learning, you know, not just language, but also 
all kinds of content and mathematics and science and all that. And they're supposed to learn all that from sometimes textbooks that they share often, um, but mainly from what the teacher says in the classroom and from the blackboard. So in that environment, one of my priorities has been to get materials to these people, but not textbooks, um, building blocks and, and counting cards and uh, all sorts of things that you can manipulate so that you can make some re reality from the, the learning that you're expected to do. So in that environment, when I think about resources, it's a whole different phenomenon uh, from the when I walk into a university classroom in North America and see all these amazing um, digital resources and people talking to people in Russia and people talking to people in Germany and having these wonderful um, resource-rich experiences that are beyond anything that I could have imagined when I was a student or a teacher. Um, so uh, I, I think um, I think the resources that I consider most um, I almost want to say dangerous. I think dangerous because they're misleading are the textbooks that make you think that if you go from page one to page 302, you have covered something. Um, and it's true that those textbooks can be useful, but I think they're not useful in, this, in, the, in the way that people sometimes think they are. Um, and they're certainly dangerous if they become the whole focus of learning and and if the if people believe that they that having covered the textbook they've covered the language um so i mean there are and there of course there are different kinds of textbooks there are textbooks that that build in um activities beyond the page and and, and there are some really wonderful um teaching materials that come straight from the you know top level publishers that that are rich and um suggestive and and but the ones that are dangerous are the ones that, you know, start with the verb to be and end with the uh, subjunctive and think that you've got some. I mean, you know, it's anyway, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying. And you're, you're the first person that's ever described them to me as dangerous. And I agree <laughs> a thousand percent. I agree a thousand percent. I think it's it's mainly I think the danger is in the false expectations. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You studied that on page forty-three, so now you know it. That's dangerous um, because you don't know it. You, but you have the maybe you have the you have a tool that you can use to continue learning it. Um, but you have to be you have to feel some confidence and some curiosity. I guess that's another. You know, it seems like somehow or other every um, every approach to teaching seems to have four C's or three C's or or the three P's, or there are always these things, but it, it just occurred to me that I talk a lot about confidence, but I think also curiosity. If you haven't fostered curiosity in your students and a desire to, to know more, um, you've really done them a disservice. And I think that's the, that's the problem with textbooks that make you think you've done that, you've been there, done that, and you, don't, you aren't motivated to go further and look for more. Well, that, that was actually something <clears throat> really interesting that I heard you talking about in, in another interview. You said that, um, you know, there are two types of students, for example, in, in North America, you have a student who maybe, you know, they speak Spanish at home and then they come to school and they will learn English in, in this kind they of content-based way, right? They must. They have no choice. <laughs> because they have no choice. And, and maybe they don't even receive any direct instruction in learning English. But then at the same school, you'll have students coming to learn maybe French, you know, who, and, and the type of instruction they get and the expectations of the teacher and the students are completely different. And that, that kind of blew my mind when you, when you pointed that out. And, and I wonder if it's a little bit of kind of Pygmalion in the classroom, like the teachers have low expectations, the students have low expectations. So... It doesn't work. I mean, is that is that what it is? Do you think that's that's very interesting? Yes, I I do think. Um, yes, I do. I do. I do. I the, the example that you gave came from my first teaching experience, where I was teaching French, but only students who were academically successful were allowed to take French, because um, that because it you know required intellectual. Um, 
you know, superiority to be able to study a foreign language. And meanwhile, the kids at the other end of the hall who were Spanish language children coming from Spanish language families had better learn English quick so they could continue their education. And I kept saying, gee, they must all be brilliant or, or else there's something wrong with this picture. Um, so yes, the expectation for the minority language child in the English speaking school was learn it and learn it fast. We'll give you a year and by then you should be ready to just hit the ground running. Uh, whereas learning French, well, we'll, you know, as long as you get a few verbs um, conjugated by the end of the year and, uh, you know, maybe a couple hundred vocabulary words, you'll be okay. Um, no, you know, it's the, the expectations really are quite different. And, 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 and I guess you don't, most people don't, well, again, we go back to how do you learn language? You learn it by using it. Um, and in a, in a so-called foreign language classroom where you spend three or four hours a week studying bits and pieces of language isolated from each other, the expectations are low. Of course they are, yeah. What would be your advice to any student out there who maybe has had the experience that you talked about at the beginning of, the, of this interview? They've studied French for six years and they've got nothing, or they've studied English for 10 years and they've got nothing. What's, what's your advice for that student to turn them into somebody who can actually do things with, with language? The first would, would be to remind them that they actually do know quite a lot because if they studied for all that time it's it, it was not for nothing but what they need to do now is to put themselves in situations where they really really care about understanding or making themselves understood to challenge themselves by putting themselves in conversations or in reading situations or television watching or film watching um, where they, they really care, they really want to know and they really want to be understood and they really want to understand. So to challenge themselves to, um, um, to make language learning a necessity and not just an, an option um, to, 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 to challenge themselves to, to not bail, to, to not run away when it gets hard. Uh, but, but to emphasize, I would assume that most of these students are people who have had six or 10 years of English instruction that focused mainly on grammar or on memorizing vocabulary, um, as opposed to students who'd had six or 10 years of content-based language teaching or other kinds of um, immersion instruction. So in that context, I would just say, be brave, be brave um, and, um, and put yourself in, in challenging situations. Beautiful advice. Okay, and my, my, my final question for you is, and I ask everybody this, I mean, you've, you've devoted almost your entire life to, to studying language and, and how we learn it. And I'm wondering, why do you think that language is important? Well, I mean, the obvious superficial answer is that it's through language that 99.9% .9 of the human species uh, communicates with the other, with, with, with each other. Um, but it isn't, I mean, there's communication. There's also identity. Um, uh, and this is one of the reasons that I feel so strongly about bilingual education or the preservation of the language that you learned in childhood. Um, why I get so distressed about um, early childhood education that emphasizes the second language instead of strengthening the first language that the children bring with them to school. Um, um, so why is language so important? I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's probably, it's the most important tool for human interaction, but it's also such a crucial part of our identity of our understanding of who we are um yeah language is um 
it really doesn't go much deeper than that, does it? It, it is it is who we are, and um, when when language is interrupted in some way, either because you move into a new environment where you don't speak the language, or when you have some kind of injury or, or illness where your language ability is disrupted, you suddenly find yourself feeling not like yourself. You are no longer you. And this is, of course, what so many adult language learners experience. They suddenly find themselves feeling um, childlike and dependent, um, and they they need to build up that confidence again in in the new language. But they have to have ex- they have to continue to have experiences in the language that in which they are fully themselves um, and not to lose that sense of self as they learn the new language. Wow, that was a, that was a beautiful answer. <laughs> um, well, uh, th- Patsy Lightbound, thank you very much for thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Well, thanks for your visit. <laughs>